record on this computer. Yeah. Okay, so uh, today's lesson will be more or less on the properties of the frame operator. And essentially, I would like to fight the statement that you could find in, in old uh, articles about Gabor analysis. It was saying, if you talk about discrete Gabor analysis, well, uh, the Gabor system, if you put every vector into a matrix, does not represent an orthonormal basis. Therefore, the frame operator is a kind of general operator, and therefore uh, the computation of the inverse must be complicated. This is, of course, pure nonsense in the, in the sense that if you, somebody tells you, can you uh, design an algorithm inverting arbitrary matrices, which are maybe very big, then the answer is yes, this will be very complicated. Already, if you know that the frame operator is a positive definite matrix, you know that you can use fast iterative algorithms. And by playing around, we have already seen that, whereas in order to do the pseudo inverse, which is the, the kind of tool uh, which allows you to represent a given vector um, by minimal norm coefficients, it's you only have to invert uh, the, the uh, frame operator and actually you only have to solve an equation, you generate one atom, and if, if it's a regular Gabor family, and then you, you do this. But there are many other properties, and uh, this is kind of what I would like to tell. So there are two key, key tools or plans that I have now. One is to describe the tools that are in the background, uh, which are kind of easy to use, uh, and uh, then how they are used and how they help you to understand the structure of Gabor frame operators. On the other hand, uh, these tools are quite universal. I think you can use them for Gabor multipliers and many other things. I think it's not, not limited. So if you go for pseudo differential operators, uh, they, this sounds like a terribly complicated uh, term, but uh, I think certain pseudo differential operators are not too, too bad. And they can also be understood quite well by uh, decomposing the input uh, and the output into Gabor building blocks. Okay, so the first one, uh, the first the, the demo file number four that I'm running first is very simple, just telling you what we can do. So I'm starting with the standard signal length, and because occasionally we need a test signal. I'm creating a complex normalized window, which is a row vector of length one. And I will use, uh, show you some properties of time frequency shift operators. So uh, one of the, the characterizations of time frequency analysis is that's the theory or the part of analysis that you can build on the time frequency shift operators. So we have seen building Gabor systems, you apply to one or to fixed number of atoms in the multi-window case, a uh, family of trans time frequency shift operators. At the moment, for, for the next little step, I would like to just um, show that uh, the time frequency operators themselves are, are interesting objects. And so uh, if you want to change the code so to see that uh, these are just random parameters, I just take, um, this is not, a, doesn't have to be a, a subgroup here, so maybe if you if you want, I could do this, change it, then it's clear that um, the time shift and the frequency shift, yeah, maybe I take uh, 13 and uh, no, well, yeah, 17 maybe. So it's clear we will see if, if something is large and small in which direction it goes. So there are two random uh, irrational quasi uh, op operators. And uh, the first thing is, that I want to recall that we can do either matrix multiplication with this, or we can do uh, uh, the operator as a, as a routine. I only have to move my, my window to the side. So if I run this, uh, then, uh, where is it? Here, you see numerically, there is no difference whether I say the routine which applies without building a matrix, of course, uh, the rot mode, which is cyclic rotation according to the input signal X. And then, of course, if you say I'm doing a time frequency shift, I think it's natural to, to put as the next argument the signal time shift first and frequency shift then. Or you're building the matrix, which is done by this command. Again, it's you have to say I need an n by n matrix 
which is representing the time shift and the frequency shift. So this is just to tell you, this is really the operator as a, described as a matrix. Uh, we will later see that uh, from all these n squared time frequency shifts, you can build any matrix. So we have clearly n cyclic shifts and frequency shifts, also cyclic. Uh, therefore, in the combination we just count, we have n squared uh, such operators. Now, if you want to see the effect, that's just a reminder. On the discrete Gauss function, you see this is having a small shift, which means on the free transform side, a not so high frequency. But on the other hand, we have a big shift on the frequency side, which means there's a relatively high multiplication, highly oscillating function here. Now, um, in order to demonstrate the next thing, which is um, the side, is a, I think it's there's another command in MATLAB now. Uh, I have called it the side digmat. So give me the side diagonal form of my matrix. And so every matrix can be viewed as a as a collection of side diagonals. And the only thing is that you may have to remember is uh, that uh, in MATLAB, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm, if I'm doing it here on the right hand side, if we have this window, uh, this, this matrix, sorry, sorry, I have to, to run it first. If I have a matrix uh, and once it's here, I can use it. Uh, and I can have this side, side diagonal T5 uh, number one. And then you see I'm getting the upper side diagonal and the diagonal command has an upper and lower and they are uh, shorter, of course. So we have um, a different purpose. We want to have side diagonals in the cyclic way. So essentially uh, something that I probably don't put here is if you have a circulant matrix, it should be a collection of functions which are constant along the side diagonals. So it's just um, one side diagonal is, if it's constant, it's just a translation operator. Okay, so uh, what is side diagonal doing? It says first you put into the first row, and that's why, because I like these row vectors, the first, the main diagonal, which is 1, 7, 13, and maybe we look at the second side diagonal which will be the second row. It's what I put as an upper diagonal, but complemented with the five. So you see it's six, 12, and so on, and the last value is five. And so, of course, you're going up, and then you have a second side diagonal or upper side diagonal, which has three values in my case, plus the two which are, are continuing. And so this is a kind of easy way. And there's another command, which is just doing the inversion. So you can say, uh, See, see what it is doing on the test matrix, uh, but uh, uh, the, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm adding just as a control for you. Uh, if I have, uh, if you do this in, in uh, uh, one after the other, so I'm saying side too much, I'm back, back to the side, uh, to the matrix form from the side diagonal form. So I'm doing side digmat of T5. And of course, I will get exactly in this case or the matrix. No. So it's just a, a, a way of, you see, it's identically, it's zero, meaning really the same figures in the storage. Now, uh, yeah, one other trivial observation, I don't have to run this series. Uh, if you take a random matrix now normalized in the Frobenius sense, so the, this is kind of a random pixel image actually, so normalized in the Hilbert-Schmidt sense, um, and you're doing the side digmat of the same matrix, then you can take the norm as a vector in the Euclidean sense, reading out all the values, or you can take the Frobenius norm, or in, Hil in functional analysis, you would get uh, the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. Yeah, you could take, uh, I don't know, the square root, made, the square root of uh, uh, trace, that would be the Hilbert-Schmidt definition, estimate multiplied with estimate prime, 
I hope I'm not blaming myself. Yeah, see, it's exactly the same. Yeah. So, but trace of a product matrix is using only diagonal entries, and that's not a very efficient way. It's much better to take the Euclidean vector coming out of the entries, and each value is only calculated once. Okay. Ah, yeah. Here is the on the random matrix the ver verification that these two operations are inverse to each other. So here I do first the inverse and then the operator, and you get the same. So this is harmless. Um, now here, yeah, I see. Sorry, uh, that the upper norm was problem. Ah, no, no, no. Sorry. Now I'm going for the time frequency shift matrix. I'm doing the same thing. Uh, and uh, and I observe that uh, the Frobenius norm of a time frequency shift operator is of course square root of n. So this is just for co no, it's not comparison. I'm yeah square root. I know it. N is just this number, uh, and that's quite clear because you're just counting how many ones do you have in a diagonal in a, side, a cyclic mat side diagonal matrix, and that, that's square root of n. Uh, now. Uh, in order to show that, of course, if you take a time frequency shift matrix, it will be more or less the matrix of a shift operator combined with the diagonal matrix. So you multiply the entries of a side diagonal. So the row norms is just a harmless comment and says, well, you're giving me a matrix and I want to know the norms of the rows of the matrix. So this is harmless private command. So I take this side diagonal matrix and I just want to demonstrate in this case it has just one side diagonal which is non-trivial. So if I compute the norms of the rows in the ordinary Euclidean sense and then I plot them and I took the stem command because it's more, then you clearly see there's only one offset. And we could check that this will be exactly because our time frequency shift had the first parameter 17. And you could uh, ask now, what are these values? And uh, then you would see there, this is 17. So yeah, maybe we could look at uh, row norms of this side diagonal matrix version. And uh, well, I would guess, uh, no, well, it should be 17, yeah, because no, or 18, I mean, that's, that's, or does it typo? Uh, maybe this has to be realized first. I think I didn't do a typo, but uh, so let's try to see. Yeah. Ah, yeah. I have a problem now with. Is the window here? Okay, so we have to go 18. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah, okay, it's plausible because it just says that if you are having the identity operator, which is just the unit matrix, then you're in, of course, zero shift, zero modulation. You're multiplying with one and you do not do any shift which is of course still, if you put it upside the first row. So when you do a shift by 17, it must be found in the 18th uh, row of my side diagonal matrix. So, but it's, it's good to, to check such things. Uh, okay, now if I plot this exact time shift operator, I see the pure frequency, which was in our case, I think the 39 or so. So this is just to tell you these matrices, uh, are exactly having these um, pure frequencies. And if you are changing the order, that's a side remark, or if you're doing column mode, then of course, these pure frequencies may be shifted a little bit. Because if you're doing a frequency time shift, you're multiplying your function first with a pure frequency, and then you shift both the function and the frequency. And we know a pure frequency is multiplied with a complex phase if you do a shift. So in this way, it's but it's, it's kind of very, very easy. Okay, now um, the next thing is, uh, and now I'm really jumping a little bit, um, I would like to convince you and, and tell you, do a few experiments showing that 
the so-called spreading representation of a matrix just allows you to, to, to demonstrate that all these n squared time frequency shift matrices are an orthonormal basis for the space of uh, for the Euclidean space of all n by n matrices. So you're saying we're jumping from signals in Euclidean space Cn, and I'm saying no, no, it's L2 of the cyclic group of order n. We are relabeling things a little bit, and now we're doing the Hilbert-Schmidt operators over the L2 space of the group. And of course, in the continuous setting, you can still do these things in in the L2 setting, and you would have integration theory and L2 theory. And my way of thinking is, then you should use this so-called banach gelfand triple. You, you do everything with a zero set, the zero setting, by sampling it and then to use the discrete routines, then verifying that it's continuous in the L2 norm. So you extend in an abstract way and by duality, or so you can expand it. So all these things that I'm doing here in MATLAB can be done in a completely general case over any locally compact abelian groups. That's kind of in the background. Okay, so. First, I'm showing you, you see two names. The routines are called mat to spread and spread to mat. So uh, spread is this representation of the matrix in this, I'm claiming, orthonormal basis of vectors. The only thing I have already checked here before is that if you take the norm, uh, the, the Frobenius norm of one of the building blocks, it's a square root of n. And so we have the same problem as with the pure frequencies in the signal level. So when you do the forward Fourier transform, what, what are we doing? We're taking scalar products between the function and the pure frequency because these are natural objects. We're not saying, well, the pure frequencies have norm square root of n and we should normalize them. Also, the same is true here. So we are, uh, or uh, no, actually it's not true, but the matter spread is trying to make this transition normal. So it's just, the basis that we claim, but normalized with square root of n, but let me just explain it first in this way. So we have one routine saying, we have the standard basis, I call it the one pixel basis, and the one pixel basis is just once more MATLAB order, one, two, three, four, five, going down the first column, then second column, and so on, unit vectors. So now we have these fancy vectors with time frequency shifts, and this is just convincing you, hopefully, that spread to mat and mat to spread are inverse to, to each other because you can go both, go both ways. And if you're taking a matrix, then uh, going to the spreading representation, uh, it's uh, changing. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, so the matrix, I'm not sure. Did I show the norm of the matrix? Maybe we should do this also here. Uh, yeah, so the matrix itself has Frobenius norm. And uh, we are in the situation that going in the forward direction, so going from the matrix to the spreading representation, we're gaining a factor. I mean, the lengths are all normalized by square root of n. This is exactly what we would have at the signal level. Uh, and it's somehow plausible because the only non-zero entries are on the side diagonal and these are only n pixels and not n squared pixels. Therefore, of course, if you do the inverse, uh, that will be exactly the opposite. So they can only be inverse to each other if they are all changing the lengths by fixed factor, which is inverse to each other. Now, uh, yeah, just to recall, that if I would do the two-dimensional Fourier transform, you could say a matrix is a pixel image and that would be norm, uh, usual, then you would see that it's uh, getting this here. But later on, maybe it's interesting to demonstrate it also here, we will need the symplectic Fourier transform. And what is the effect of the symplectic Fourier transform in the Frobenius norm? And uh, uh, it's just preserving the lengths. Uh, later on, I think we have already mentioned it, but if not, it will, this will come. The symplectic Fourier transform is essentially a forward Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform combined with the uh, change of rows and columns. 
So uh, two dimension. I, I will do this if if I, haven't, I probably have not done it. So I will do it separately in in more detail. So a forward two dimensional Fourier transform is essentially a Fourier transform row wise and column wise. So you can say I'm multiplying my image, let's say a square image with the Fourier matrix from the left, then you're doing it column wise. Then you're again doing it from the right, which is you do an action row wise, recalling that the Fourier matrix, the FFT of I of N is a symmetric matrix in the sense of real symmetry. So maybe I should do this later on or recall this later on. So the symplectic Fourier transform that, that will pop up also here uh, is having the property that it's an involution. If you apply it twice, it's identity. So if you have any involution, it will preserve the length of the vector because if it would uh, stretch any vector without uh, compressing at the same time, it would not be working. So that's why it's completely plausible that the FFT multiplies uh, the lengths, the Frobenius norm of a matrix by n. Uh, the inverse IFFT, of course, will do the same thing. We can try to test it. And the symplectic Fourier transform is normalized in a good way such that you have this here. Oh yes, here, here, you, here it comes. Uh, so I'm demonstrating that FFT2 on a random matrix is just matrix multiplication from the left and from the right. Uh, now, what is uh, FFT? Uh, that's the matrix representing uh, the, the vector. Just recall once more, if I take my such a random vector, 1n, and I want to see that the FFT of that vector is can be realized by matrix multiplication. And fortunately, I, I, I mentioned already, maybe also norm of f minus f transpose uh, we can verify quickly the matrix the Fourier matrix is equal to its transpose it's not transpose conjugate of course the inverse uh, yeah we can also do this uh, the norm of the inverse of f and of f prime divided by n. We all know that the inverse free transform more or less is realized by taking the country, okay, sorry, if I take norm, I have to, to do a minus here. If I take the inverse free transform, I have the conjugate terms. I have the e to the plus two pi i, not e to the minus. And I have to normalize it with the fact with the square root, with, with n. So the, that's quite clear. Okay, so the main point of, of this experiment below is here. FFT2, two-dimensional Fourier matrix. When you implement, when it's implemented, is of course uh, with the for loop. You are saying apply the FFT to each column, which means, uh, yeah, you could also do the test here. I'm doing one more thing. Of course. Um, F with the matrix or FFT of the matrix. That's just the the verification that F is the, really the matrix doing the Fourier transform plus two conventions. When you are doing matrix multiplication of here F on the matrix mat on the random matrix, then you're doing it column wise. And on the right hand side is a convention. If you are applying the Fourier transform to a the one-dimensional Fourier transform FFT command to a, to a matrix. It's not saying, oh, we know functions on different groups have to have that different FFTs, but it says, no, a matrix is a collection of vectors and I have to apply it by the first, second, and so on. That's why actually we get the, uh, the Fourier transform matrix by applying it to the unit matrix. No, MATLAB says I have to apply it to the basis vectors, which are the first, the second, and third unit vector. And that's why you get the matrix in this way. Okay. So we have uh, different kinds of, of things. And now, uh, yeah, here, okay, yeah, I see. There, we are testing now the behavior of the symplectic Fourier transform. Without telling you beforehand what it is, I will show you. The first thing is, 
it preserves the Frobenius norm. Second step uh, here, if I apply it twice, I'm back getting back. Uh, the other thing is, uh, if I what is this yeah if i apply oh yeah if i apply the food so in in this on the right hand side of this uh, um, expression we are doing a, a Fourier transform column wise so the, the left multiplication f with matrix is column wise we're doing an inverse free transform. I have just shown that inverse is transpose conjugate divided by n. And uh, if I do this, I will get the transpose matrix. So the mat dot prime is just transpose. So uh, it's plausible that if we want to, uh, yeah, here it's just the same thing with the IFFT. So uh, what I'm doing now is just to show you and, and the, the precise uh, realization is, I mean, more or less, I'm showing you the elegant version of this. The symplectic Fourier transform, what is it doing? Well, it's creating this F, F symplectic matrix. And here you see what I'm really doing when I apply, do it efficiently, not by matrix multiplication. I'm saying I take the matrix, I apply the inverse Fourier transform. Then I do a transpose conjugate, or I'm, I, I, pardon, transpose, transposition, and then I'm doing a forward. So the very nasty or, or simple-minded way to recall what is the symplectic Fourier transform? Well, you apply a forward transform, Fourier transform, which magnifies things. You apply an inverse, which shrinks everything. So it's plausible that it's uh, plus doing a transposition. Uh, now, um, I had another version of it. So I think this is the most elegant version of, of doing it. But probably you can find, uh, I don't know, probably uh, six or maybe 14 other versions which are not correct and two or three which are correct if you're trying all the combinations of when should you do a transpose or transpose conjugate, doing a pl uh, first apply free transform or so on. So I think this is the, uh, one of the good versions. Yeah, here again, uh, I'm coming back to what I just showed you. FFT is just going column-wise. IFFT is, is, uh, can be done also column-wise by multiplication. And the symplectic free transform. Here, here you see another method. It's forward and inverse, and then you are doing the transposition at the end. Now, uh, yeah, you see here I've tried several versions. Here, yeah. And maybe if you look at it, it, you may find that I'm just doing, uh, I'm confusing you by all these different versions. Uh, and one should write down more clearly that you have to do the transposition at the right moment. I think that that's, that's the uh, story here. You see here, do the matrix, do the transposition to a forward and inverse Fourier transformer. So, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, the next thing is, there is something called the Cohn-Nuremberg symbol. And uh, I learned about this from Bernard Kotzek, who was using it. And it's in a way um, the idea to say that you have a position invariant transfer function. So if you go back to convolution operators, then we're saying, well, a convolution operator is just a moving average. So you're taking a, a linear functional or a row vector, um, if the sum of the coefficients is one, then it's really a moving average. And then you're saying, I apply it to my matrix, to my a signal or so. And then you're going shifting everything by one pixel and applying the same average or so. And we have seen, or it's, it's the standard uh, Fourier analysis now, that either you have a multiplication with a circle of matrix or such a elegant way of writing it, a Cauchy product type, convolution operator, or you're just saying, no, I diagonalize it. I can go to the Fourier transform side and I do a multiplication. So multiplying on the Fourier transform side with one function is fine. Now, if you're having a system which people in, in engineering would call time variant, you would say, well, 
I still want to work with relative coordinates. I don't want to take this big matrix and say, now if I compute, uh, I don't know, output coordinate number seven, I have to use some row and column of the matrices. But I would say, no, I'm doing moving averages. But because of certain reasons, I'm changing the profile of the moving average. This is actually what occurred in the in the uh, discussions with the engineers when we were doing mobile communication. So essentially, uh, in that case, and that's where, where we really this was applicable. Uh, you have multipass propagation from the sending station to your mobile phone, uh, and that's like a convolution operator. But once you even change your position within the room or you're walking around the corner in the street, this profile is changing. Of course, not drastically, um, but uh, it's not really the same blurring, so to say. It's like the acoustics, depending on which place in the auditorium you have in the theater, uh, will be different. And if you walk around, uh, you will say, well, the filter is a different around the corner. And in this way, you can study slowly varying channels. And the point was, uh, where, where this was relevant, that Werner Kotzik was explaining to us that these are underspread operators. So these are operators which in the spreading domain, they are not the identity as they were pretending in, in mobile communication for a while, but they are still very specific, they are underspread. And nowadays we will, we, and that's related to the topic of this course, underspread operators can be represented or approximated very well as Gabor multipliers. And therefore, this is a very good. Now, in this business, it turned out that the Kornierberg symbol, something which is um, in the spirit of engineers, a way to describe an operator by locally varying transfer functions. So the idea is, I have a moving average. If it was constant for a while, I would say it's a convolution operator and I have a transfer function. But now I'm moving to another position a little bit further and now having slightly different convolution curl. Therefore, I would have a slightly different transfer function. So somehow you can imagine that if you have a slowly varying system and you describe it by local transfer function behavior, that such a system will have a smooth Kornierberg symbol. And this is really what we will see also in, in the, all the examples. Uh, the Kornierberg symbol and the spreading function are related by the symplectic Fourier transform. And so if we were saying an underspread operator is very well concentrated, it's plausible that its Fourier transform will be smooth. And I was already explaining to you this locally, uh, slowly changing, varying, uh, slowly varying system will have a smooth Kornierberg symbol. Well, that means its Fourier transform will be well concentrated. So uh, we're kind of at one stroke getting two more representations of a linear operator on our signal space. We have the description as a matrix, which is description in the, in the unit vector basis. So that's the standard description. We can describe it also on the Fourier transform side. And you will say, perfect. On the Fourier transform side, a, a convolution operator is just a diagonal matrix. And now what we are trying to do is to say, well, if it's slowly varying, this local transfer function, the Kornierberg symbol will be slowly varying, or in the spreading domain, we will have some concentration. And so this is uh, what what is the uh, kind of the intermediate goal, not for today, but for today and the next maybe one or two lessons. So just now again, playing around, there's a routine saying, you give me the matrix and I convert it to the so-called Kornierberg symbol, KNS. It's MAT to KNS. And of course, in the continuous setting, I would say it's a Banach Gelfand triple isomorphism and so on. But here, I would just verify that this is an inverse routine. So it's just verifying in both directions first, taking a random matrix, or I would say a random Cohn Nuremberg symbol, which actually should be viewed as a function of phase space. But in the finite setting, the phase space is n cyclic group of order n times cyclic group of order n, so there's no problem. So here, mat mat is taken in the second example as a matrix, which is a function on phase space. You convert it from um, from the 
uh, matrix now from the Con Nuremberg description uh, to the matrix and uh, then I'm using the corresponding matrix so the operator back to the Con Nuremberg symbol and I'm getting the original back and so these are inverse to each other and now uh, I'm uh, recalling that's now uh, something that we have done already in between if you take uh, the mat to spread I can do the show that it's preserving the the norm. Yeah, so kind of this is just if you if I take two random matrices, I can convert them to vectors. We have seen this already, and we can take the ordinary scalar product because to column vectors you have to take the conjugate one in the first position as a row vector, or you can take the Hilbert-Schmidt viewpoint, which is the trace of a composed with B a joint mapping. So this is now okay. Um, the uh, the thing that I would like to explain to you uh, before demonstrating that these uh, time frequency shift operators are really an autonomous system, uh, maybe that's not even necessary. Or auto, yeah, it's not an autonomous system. It's an uh, orthogonal system where each vector has the same length, so like the pure frequencies. So uh, I'm taking this uh, spreading function. So once more, there's a routine now called mat to spread that, that will be discussed a little bit. And uh, it's saying, well, we take this random operator xx as a matrix. And we want to convert it to the, to the domain. And I'm claiming that this is just a coefficient in the representation where the representation is it will take scalar products with respect to certain specific matrices. So I'm taking out of the collection of the um, of the time frequency shift basis now at the operator level, I'm taking out a particular one. And we know already that uh, we have given this a name, which is the time frequency matrix. Maybe I'm running it once more. Uh, okay, I have to run this first. So I'm creating a new vector and a new matrix. Now I can do this. Uh, so what I'm doing here is in the line 686, I'm taking the Hilbert Schmidt's color product between my time frequency shift matrix. You remember with the parameters 1739 or so against this random operator and as we expect um, you can take this now um, I mean I think let me see uh, oh yeah I, I see the, the line 86 only shows you that if you're uh, changing the order, then you're getting the conjugate value as you, as you expect. And uh, actually we should take the scalar product of the matrix that we want to analyze with respect to the TFM prime. So um, kind of the, this is just a, a demo of the scalar product. But when we do it, we should really, okay, I'm not sure now. Yeah, I think that was the consequence that I was first starting to take X with TFM. Yeah, I think that the point is, yeah, okay, so it's, it's correct, yeah. We think of the scalar product of our random matrix with a time frequency shift operator. So you would write the matrix first and it's a Hilbert-Schmidt operator norm of the matrix X with the time frequency shift operator. We write usually pi lambda if the time shift lambda has the parameters time and, and frequency parameter. But when you convert it and you realize it in MATLAB, you say, well, I have to take the vectors. So you make both the column vectors. And even if I am working in the column, in the row mode, in order to compute now in purely MATLAB, the scalar product, I have to give the time frequency shift operator the conjugate. And that's why I use this term here. So it's putting in the first position, but this is just the convention of mathematics with MATLAB. Now, uh, I was actually 
yesterday or, or the day before preparing this and I was saying well now I'm making a full test so we sh I demonstrate that the spreading function is computed yeah so kind of uh, uh, this is maybe a, a routine not to spread uh, of xx and uh, uh, sorry the TikTok is just my version, so my private version. Uh, and uh, it shows that you compute it in a frame. I mean, the display is very slow here, but you, dis you compute it very quickly. Actually, it costs, roughly speaking, the same amount of uh, time as a two-dimensional Fourier transform. So I thought, well, but if I go according to the definition and I compute it now in this way as I do this individual term, one by one, I will can show you that it's really the same. But I was waiting, I don't know, for 20 minutes or so, because it's so slow to really build the matrices and take color products one by one. So it's really good to have a theoretical background if you want to work with this. So that's why I'm, I restricted the attention to the first three. So I was saying, let's compute color products in exactly this way so now these color products are according to shift parameters 0 1 2 in the time and in the frequency domain and uh, then i was doing this and of course you have seen that uh, maybe disturbing also these numbers are uh, look different or so but in this routine i was then checking everything so that it's working properly so i was filling in into a three by three scheme the matrix HH. Here I'm computing this by hand by hand color product, whereas in the other case I'm comparing it now with this spreading function which is pre computed. So uh, it's a bit difficult for me, but I think you can see it now. If you compare the numbers, the first number is okay. The second number is okay, also the second column is okay. There's no conjugation or so, but the trick was uh, that I'm displaying n times the spreading function. So that that what was what has had to be done. And also, uh, yeah, that, that was another thing which I caused me some some uh, playing around. I was really worried because I thought, well, the routine has been working all the time quite well, but I never checked. Uh, for in the last, I don't know, few years, where that's really doing this if you do it by hand, because I never had to do it by hand anymore. But you have to be careful. You put have to put it in the right position. So recall that we are doing time frequency shifts. And how do we organize it? Well, we have dots in the time frequency plane. And we put these dots in the matrix. And now the, the, the problem is that we have a conflict of conventions. If you were saying, I put everything into a matrix, then you would say, I have rows and columns. So you talk about rows first, and then of, about columns. But if you visualize, and I think that's the strong argument, you think that time is going in a horizontal way, and frequency is going in a vertical way, up and down. And so you have to be careful. Uh, the idea is, of course, that I am doing a time frequency shift. So the K is the time frequency parameter. And you have to put it as a second coordinate. That's the column number because time is the column number in in your in our spreading matrix. So we would like to have exactly at the place which corresponds to the time frequency shift operator, where we said, well, these are the time frequency shift operators that we would like to use to build a Gabor family. This had to be done. Plus, there is this uh, indices go from zero. Uh, I mean. MATLAB indices have to go from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But when you think of the time shift, again, identity operator is zero shift, zero mod modulation. That's why, uh, well, you have to think a little bit why this is the correct way of doing it. But at the end, it is the correct way. So you put in the, in the uh, uh, you build time frequency shift matrices where K is the time shift. But when you insert the value into the spreading matrix, it has to done, be done in the horizontal direction. So it's the, becoming the call number plus this adjustment of, of the, and so these, these are the same, 
and here you have uh, uh, a comparison, so not the visual comparison, but these matrices are really the same. Now, uh, I have already indicated that uh, there might be an interesting connection between this spreading representation and uh, the Kornierberg symbol, and it's actually through the symplectic Fourier transform. So uh, we have on the left hand side, the first expression in line 97 is we're doing a, a Kornierberg symbol from the random operator X. Or we can do the spreading representation and uh, then we could do the symplectic Fourier transform. And because the symplectic Fourier transform, as I was demonstrating before, is a one to one relationship, I mean, it's involution, so if you apply it twice, this is just a confirmation that, of course, you can come back from the Kornierberg symbol to the spreading representation. And you see here, uh, the, what, what does the, do these uh, figures tell you? It's not, yeah, it shows you that in the first case, this is how it is computed. So it's really, we compute the spreading function and then we take a, the symplectic Fourier transform. Uh, you could, uh, may maybe it's not done exactly in this way because a symplectic Fourier transform is a two-dimensional Fourier transform and creating the spreading function, there's also a one-dimensional Fourier transform. I think it's just cancelled out or so, but it's more or less an indication how it is done. We have not tried to do extremely optimizing of, of so optimization of code, whereas the other one is just showing numerically we're getting back, but that's not how it is computed. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the next thing is, uh, and the rest of, of this lesson will be, how can we use these representations or um, what can we say about the Gabor frame operator? And uh, I think, well, maybe I, I stop here the recording and make a short break. Uh,